a hero risks his life to save an innocent bystander. What would you do if you were driving through the woods and you spotted a bizarre man walking across the street? And then we traveled to Colombia to take a look at the bizarre story of a series of murders that took place there. Is it possible that a man was trying to harvest the blood of young people? Or was everyone simply wrong? Today on Dead Rabbit Radio. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Dead Rabbit Radio. I'm your host Jason Garvin, I'm having a great day. I hope you guys are having a great day too. We got a lot of stuff to cover, so let's go ahead and get started on this. First off, let's give a shout out to one of our legacy Patreons coming into Dead Rabbit Command right now. Everyone give him a salute and clap somehow do it at the same time. It's David Lazaridis. Everyone give a round of applause to David. Longtime Patreon supporter. Really, really appreciate it. David, you're going to be our captain, our pilot this episode. If you guys can't support the Patreon, I totally get it. Just spread the word about the show. Leave reviews about it. Talk to your friends. Talk to your family. Talk about it online. I want to see more of that. That is also how you can help the show. David, I'm going to go ahead and toss you the... Let's see. I'm going to go ahead and toss you a steam shovel. But let's hop in the carpenter caboose. We're going to take a little train journey. We're leaving behind Dead Rabbit Command. We are headed out to Culpeper, Virginia. chuck 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 David is David has on his little conductor hat. He brought it with him. We're taking the carpenter caboose all the way out to Virginia. It was June 2nd, 2021, so just a couple weeks ago. Ralph Dorn, a 62-year-old man, is walking along a lake in Culpeper, Virginia. He's walking there with his six-year-old golden doodle, Harvey. That's a real dog. That's not an imaginary thing I made up. It's a real dog. Harvey, the golden doodle, is walking next to Ralph. (laughs) Ralph says he's such a hot day, I'm panting, and the dog's like, me too. All of a sudden, Harvey jumps into the lake and starts paddling out into the water. And Ralph's like, well, that's kind of weird. I mean, it is really hot. out. It's hot enough to make me pant. Harvey jumps in the water and starts swimming. He sees something about 200 feet off the shore. He sees something kind of bobbing in the water. You guys might have already read this story. You guys already know the twist. I don't know know if it's a twist, but I wanted to share it anyways. It was pretty big news. Anyways, Harvey is swimming out to the water. and. Ralph's trying to figure out what's going on, and he sees a a baby. No, not, he sees a baby deer. <laughs> Probably shouldn't have paused there. He sees a baby deer. You're like, what? There's a human baby 200 feet offshore just floating around. Is it like Moses floating there? No, it's a baby deer. It's a little fawn, and it's barely treading water. It's going meh, meh, and it's like sinking, right? And so Harvey, the wonder dog... The greatest golden doodle ever saw this little fawn and jumped in the water and went, swam over to him and was like, come here this way, buddy. And he's like poking him with his nose. (laughs) When no one's looking, he takes a little bite out of him. No one will know. But he's like, he's like nuzzling over this fawn and he gets the fawn back to land. And at that point, Ralph's like, he shrugs his shoulder. Yeah, I guess I should help now. I probably could have jumped in earlier. He reaches down. He picks this fawn up. He said it had to just be a couple days old. It was a tiny little baby fawn. And he picks it up and he puts it on the shore. And the there's video of this. The fawn's like kind of trying to learn how to walk again. Well, it, did, it didn't get bonked on the head and forget how to walk, but it's trying to get its legs back. It's probably really scared. And Harvey jumps out of the water and he's licking him. He's like, nom, nom, nom. You're not tasting him. He's not he did that when he took the bite out of him. He's like trying to be like, no, you're okay, dude. This is how dogs say you're okay. He's like licking the licking the fawn, making sure that, you know, he feels good. And then, like, Harvey and Ralph are there, and this little fawn's like, probably, probably like, okay, you can quit licking me now. I get it. I get it. And then the mama deer shows up, and she's, like, looking through the woods. And Ralph goes, okay, we need to leave the fawn alone because the mom mama deer is going to be super nervous. And Harvey didn't want to leave. Harvey didn't want to leave his new buddy, but... Ralph's like, no, no, come on. He's dragged away this golden doodle. He's like, no, I want to lick him more and maybe take another bite. So the next day, they're at home. Ralph is sitting there reading the newspaper. (laughs) Never mind, the story takes place in 2021. He's probably on a tablet. And Harvey is sitting there, just sitting in the living room. And then Harvey gets up and runs to the door and starts barking. Ralph's like, that's weird. That's when he gets a shotgun. He's afraid he's going to get broken into. 
He goes and he's the fawn is back. The fawn is now standing in their front yard. And so Ralph opens the door and Harvey runs out and runs up to the fawn and then stops. And then he goes, they kind of smelled each other for a bit. And then he goes, Harvey and the fawn just turned away and walked away silently from each other. Like Harvey, you could barely peel Harvey away the first time. But this time the fawn came back to basically say, thank you. Isn't that a beautiful story? Isn't that a beautiful Harvey made a new friend. He saved a life. He saved the life of a little fawn. And maybe you're like, Jason, what is the show becoming? Well, put on our conspiracy caps. Maybe an alien teleported the deer up. And then they go, no, nah, nah, we don't want this deer. We want another deer. And then dropped him down in the water in broad daylight. They did that in broad daylight. So there you go. There's like a paranormal angle. But I don't think I need a paranormal angle for that. I think... The fact that this first episode of this pod... This is episode 700, by the way. The first episode of this podcast, I talked about talking animals, interspecies, or... Yeah, extra species, I think, or interest. It doesn't matter. The point is, is that this time we have animals of different species talking to each other. and That's really dope. And Harvey saved this little deer person. And maybe someday... Harvey will be like in jail. He'll be like, oh man, I should have stopped biting all these mailmen. And then he hears like a key turning. And he looks and that fawn, <laughs> that fawn got a job with the police department. He was the very first deer cop. And he actually rose up through the ranks. And then he's the captain and he's using a key. Somehow they have a key specifically designed for hoof. He goes, Harvey, you did horribly maul all those postal workers but you are now free to go. Just don't do it again. My reputation's on the line. Maybe that maybe that will happen. Most likely it will not. But anyways, I wanted to share that awesome story with you. Harvey, the golden doodle, you're one hot dog, which, which is literal now because the world is burning. David, let's go ahead and toss you. You're like, David's like, seriously? Seriously, that's the first story I get. I get some heart heartwarming story. Jason, what's going on with you? Well, David, I know that story's not normal Dead Rabbit Radio stuff, but I love it. And I know a lot of you guys love it too. And we got some spooky stuff coming. So, David, I'm going to go ahead and toss you the keys to the Jason Jalopy. We're leaving behind Virginia. We are headed out to Nevada. <laughs> David is driving us on this little road trip. Air conditioner is going on full blast. It's summer 1997. We're in the Humboldt Toya Bee Forest in Nevada. This is an interesting thing because this is this isn't the reason why I'm doing this topic. David's rolling his eyes. He's like, seriously, this is why you're covering this. The Humboldt Toya Bee Forest is a national park, but it's the only national park in the United States that's two parks. It's not one giant collection of forests. I guess they had the Humboldt National Park, and then they had another a national park. It's like on the other side of the state, and they ran out of money or something like that. They were selling trees to loggers. They're like, no, 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 you can't do that. I guess they couldn't manage one of the parks, so one of them took it over. So it's a national park, but it's separated by hundreds of miles. That is not, that's not why I'm covering it. I'm not saying it's some sort of conspiracy or anything like that. I found this story on the export. I thought it was really interesting. It was just this little green text story. But it's summer. It's 1997. We're in the Humboldt Toya Bee Forest in Nevada. Did you know? No, I'm just joking. Did you know there's three different types of trees there? No, that's not why we're talking about it. There's a 10-year-old boy. I'm going to take a... We'll call him Joey. If that's your real name, it's just a shot in the dark. We call him Joey. And his stepdad are on a road trip. And they're passing through this national forest. And as they're going through this forest, they see cars driving by, normal stuff, birds hanging out. Then they see a man start to walk out of the forest. Joey's sitting there, and he immediately realizes that's not a man. And he's actually kind of at a loss to words to describe it. He had to use a picture to really give the visual for it. He goes, what this thing was, was a pig man. He goes, I don't mean he was a big fat guy. He's very, very clear. I don't mean that he has a pig nose. It was as if a pig, a six-foot-tall pig, was walking on two feet. He was wearing clothes. He was fully dressed. And he didn't have hooves for hands. He had clawed hands. 
and it's casually walking across the street in the middle of this national forest. Your first instinct, it's a man in a mask. But he said, one, this was 1997. So he he goes, I don't think they had good masks back then. I mean, Deep Space Nine had some pretty good makeup effects. But here's the thing, and the reason why I love this story is because I've seen something similar to it. He said it could have been a mask, but this mask perfectly matched the musculature of how a upright pig would move, how its face would move, even the the gloves. If they were fake, they looked too real to be fake. I t- covered this in a story a long time ago where I saw a... Uh, I can only assume it was a demonically possessed man. I was sitting in a stoplight. I'll put the full episode in the show notes, but... If you haven't listened to that one, I was sitting in a stoplight. It was in Sacramento. I was on Greenback and Hazel. And I see a car in the far turn lane. And I look and it's a guy dressed up as a clown. It's a guy in clown. Which you see people dressed up as clowns, right? There are professional clowns. But I see a man dressed up as a clown. But his face looked a little distorted. And I'm sitting there at the red light. And he does this turn. You know, it's like the traffic's flowing. There's full broad daylight. There's tons of cars there. He's just one of dozens of cars getting ready to go down the road he's turning and his turn takes him close to me and it's such a wide turn because i'm turning in my turn lane he's turning his turn lane we're in such a wide turn that i have a great view of him and he had a clown face but it wasn't a mask and it wasn't make you're like jason they put makeup on too no it wasn't that it was demonic it had large razor sharp teeth it reminded me of baraka from uh, mortal kombat And his mouth was moving like he was talking, and there were kids in the car with him, if I remember correctly. And he was talking, and it's so funny, because now we know so much about CGI and how hard it is to replicate humans. And it's very hard to have, even with the most advanced computers, to show a human talking and for it to look authentic. Because we're used to all of these micro-movements that we don't even think of. That our eyes can go, that's weird, that shouldn't be there. Superman Superman looks like he had a mustache airbrushed out. Just that little bit of skin, you can tell something's wrong. This was so realistic looking. It, the, the mask would have had to have been sewn on to his face. And he drove by and he no one in the car is reacting that they're in the car with the demonic clown. He wasn't doing anything super creepy other than looking like a demonic uh, clown. But it looked like it was part of his skin. It looks real. It looks natural. It's the same thing when you're looking at someone and you're having coffee with them and you're watching their face. All of those micro movements we are so used to as a human. So when they're not there, you notice them. So that w- I always love stories that line up to stuff I've seen because I can say, I mean, this is green text from X. This could easily be made up. But that detail rings so true to me. And so let me finish this story here because it's not done. They see this pig man nonchalantly walk across the road. And he goes, my dad was driving the car. We drive past it. We keep driving. We keep driving. There's a rest stop coming up. It's the next rest stop. And he goes, my dad pulled into the rest stop. And we just sat there. He said, we just sat there. We were barely talking to each other. We both just sat in this car and contemplated what we had seen. He saw it too. So it wasn't a 10-year-old boy's imagination. The dad saw it too. And not only did he pull over the car, he doubted his ability to continue this journey because he thought he was going insane. But since his son had seen it as well, All they could do is sit in silence and wonder what had just walked out of the woods. Creepy, creepy story. And I love it because the stakes are so low. That's always nice when we find these stories that have a weird event. The stakes are super low. Don't get me wrong. Abduction stories, alien abduction stories are great. Ghost possession stories are great. But there's also something even more terrifying just about a mundane event. They didn't go out into the middle of Aerojet and Chino Hills and go looking for the pig man and see something rustling in the bush. It's a wild boar. It's coming after them. Ah. No, they're just taking a nice leisurely journey as father and son. And something just walked out of the woods and crushed their reality. Fascinating, fascinating story. 
David, I'm going to go ahead and toss you the keys of the carpenter copter. We are leaving behind Nevada. They're like, save us from the pig man. He came back. He's rocking their cars. They're, they're sitting at the uh, rest area. We're like, no, nah, you guys can take them. I'm sure you guys will do just fine. We're leaving behind Nevada. We're headed out to Cali. That's in Valley Dale, Cuaca, Colombia. <laughs> November 5th, 1963. A paper boy. Okay, this one gets grim before I continue on. Before I continue on, you just sat down with your Gatorade. You're like, story three. He just did one about a dog saving a fawn. And then he had a father and son journey. This one, this one must also be super lighthearted. Let's, it gets dark. Okay. I had to catch myself before I finished this sentence. November 5th, 1963. A paper boy is found murdered in the city of Cali. December 4th. Another boy is found dead in a field on the outskirts of town. December 12th, a third boy. This one was found on the shore of the Aquacatal River. His eyeballs were gone. Okay? <laughs> like I said, this one gets dark. By the end of the year, two more children were found in the city. Now, at this point, people are outraged because they think, one, there's a serial killer. And not only is it a serial killer, it's preying on young children. Police are on the case. They're going to figure this out. They're going to stop this madman. But 1964 rolls around, and even more children are found murdered. So people are demanding answers. People are trying to figure out, well, guys, what's going on? Like, I don't feel comfortable with my kid's going out at night. My kid's going out at night. He has a job at the local bar. He's, he's the bouncer. What are you going to do about it, police? And the police start looking into this. And they, they, this story is really, really interesting. It's really, really interesting because the police start looking into this. And as they're investigating this, these bodies keep piling up. And so do the rumors. Some people say that these children were found... This this does get... I'm going to try to not get so graphic, but... Some people say that these children were found with golden needles inserted into their hearts. Some people said that these same needles were actually pushed into their thorax while they were still alive. The bodies showed signs of torture. The bodies showed signs... Of sexual assault. And as the police are trying to hunt down the perpetrator. And these stories are growing. People are getting more afraid. If the cops can't catch him. And he's still in this area. Can he be caught? Is he even human? Because then people start to say the bodies are found. Drained of blood. The people in the region name this man the Monster of the Mangons. And truly was a monster, right? Who could do that to children? But the police investigate this and they say, What murders? What, what murders are you talking about? This is weird. This is so weird. I've never seen a collision of all these different elements before. Because overall, between 1963 and 1974, there was between 30 to 38 boys and young men found dead in the city of Cali. That's a fact. But the police are saying most of these bodies, so you can figure some of them may be uh, just random deaths. Some of them may be, they. I don't think the cartels are active back in the 60s, so it could have just been like rival businessmen or, or just oh, a, a random weirdo. But the police say there were not 30 to 38 murders. There was far, far less than that. A statistical amount of people are going to get killed in a city on any given month. Some cities any given day, but they say these kids aren't being murdered. People go, there's bodies being found. And the police go, yes. We're not denying that. We're not saying that's like a, a trick of the light. That is a young body that's found. But he, he wasn't murdered. He was dug up from a grave. Most of these children had died of other causes, were buried, 
someone's digging up their corpses and scattering them around the city. That shouldn't that should shouldn't make you feel that much better, right? Like you would breathe a sigh of relief that there's not a serial killer on the loose, but there's still a weirdo mutant man walking around who's digging up these bodies and then just depositing them. So the cops say there is no monster of the man gone. Or at least in the fact that they, he's not a serial killer. He might just be some weirdo pervert. And this thing with the golden needles that's made up. The thing with the torture that's made up. The blood missing from the body. Yeah, they're desiccated. They were dug up from the ground. Sexual assault and torture? What are you guys talking about? These children have been dead for a while. Someone's digging them up and putting them around town. And, and so you would ask, well, that why are they doing that? And the police said, simple, we actually have a reason for that. We have a lot of enemies here. The police have a lot of enemies in the city of Cali. And there was a political fight going on. And he, police say, someone's trying to make us look bad and make our leadership look bad. So they invented a fake serial killer to make us look incompetent. How can we catch somebody who doesn't exist? So they're digging up these bodies. They might not even be digging them up from Cali cemeteries because that would be, uh, you would obviously be investigating, and that's weird, we have all these grave robberies, the guys would be investigating that and then all these bodies. The bodies could be coming from other cities. But they're saying there is no serial killer. Yeah, maybe like five or six of these kids could have been murdered. They're like, that's horrible. It is horrible. It's absolutely horrible, but you're going to have a level of murders in any given city. But 30 to 38, absolutely not. These are dug up bodies to make us look bad. But the rumors stick. The rumors stick and they actually grow. People begin to identify a suspect. There's a man known as Don Alonzo Aristisbal. <laughs> don't, don't, do not call him by that name. You will get really mad that you mispronounced it. Do not take that to heart. People started to notice that one of the wealthiest men in town, Don Alonzo, was starting to look a little gaunt. Starting to look weak. He had leukemia. He was slowly dying. But sometimes he'd be seen with a little more pep in his step. He'd tip his hat, a little, tip his hat a little bit quicker. That's weird. Why does Don Alonzo look so healthy today? He should look like he's dying. The story began to circulate that this rich man had stumbled across the fountain of youth. Children's blood. A very, very familiar trope. People have always thought that the blood of the young can rejuvenate people. There are actual scientists trying to make breakthroughs on that today. And they're selling... They're trying to say that they can do it. The science is still out. I don't think it's going to work the way they want it to. I think aging is a natural problem. You, you wrinkle. I always heard, I could be totally wrong on this. I'm never wrong on this podcast. But a lot of wrinkle, your wrinkles are because gravity is pulling down on your skin all the time. And so your skin's like, really? <laughs> I'm pretty sure that's it, right? So if you were floating around in space, you wouldn't wrinkle. I mean, you'd probably starve to death and be really lonely, but you wouldn't wrinkle. But anyways, I'll, I'm going to fact check that. If this is still in the podcast, that means that I was right. And if it's not, you'll never know. Or I would have forgotten to edit it out. The point is, is that even if you can rejuvenate yourself with children's blood today, with 2021 technology of like removing plasma and stuff like that, definitely couldn't do it back in 63. But the story is that Don Alonzo had his goons going out. And they were taking these children, draining their blood, and then bringing it back to Don Alonzo so he could live a little bit longer. What's really interesting about that urban legend is, let's say that's true for a second. Let's put on our conspiracy caps. That doesn't jive with any of the other stuff, right? Why would you need to do the, the golden needles in the heart? Why would you need to do the sexual torture? Now, I know with adrenochrome nowadays, the theory is, is like you torture people... And then that makes it extra tasty. But that's not, he's not sitting, he's not holding a taste testing here. He's trying to cure his leukemia. So why would they do all of these other things? Why would they do the torture? Why would they poke him in the throat with the needle? It doesn't make any sense. Um, but I think that's how just urban legends develop. 
But whoever it was, or whatever it was, no one was ever caught. No one was caught stealing bodies from graveyards. No one was caught murdering children. No one was caught delivering vials of blood to Don Alonzo. The story just ended. But remember, this is over the course of 10 years. This isn't a a summer of clown sightings. From 1963 to the 1970s, this story continued to dominate this town. And 30 to 38 bodies were found. Question is, is, were they already dead? I don't think I've ever come across an urban legend that has... Usually when we cover urban legends, it's like the Pope Lick Monster, where there's this bridge that we think a train went off it back in like the 1890s, and there was some circus freak on there, and he ran off, and now somehow he's still alive in the year 2021, and he's still attacking people. And it's all because there's a bridge that's spooky on the outskirts of town. This is an interesting urban legend because it's built off a truth. Bodies being found all over the city. That's so bizarre. And then they're working backwards on that. What's doing that? And of course, your first answer is going to be it's a serial killer. It's a serial killer. You're going to catch this guy. But then we start getting into this stuff where... There, it's not just a serial killer. It's a man trying to prolong his life. I mean, he's still a serial killer by definition, but he's trying to perform some sort of scientific miracle or magic miracle. Very, very interesting. We recently covered the story of the... I don't remember the name of it. I'll put the episode in the show notes, but it was children over in Morocco, I believe, who were being killed because people thought they were half gin, And if they could get a kid who was half gin it would lead them to buried treasure. And that was one where the urban legend, this is a real crime issue over there. That's one where the urban legend is causing murders. Horrible. People believe this superstition, and they're murdering children. They're kidnapping children and murdering them because of it. This one is an urban legend that started from murders. And because they didn't catch the guy, you still have a division in the area. Some people believe that it was Don Alonzo, who I would assume is dead at this point, right? If he had leukemia in 1963 and he's still alive, he should be a suspect. But some people probably still believed it was Don Alonzo. Some people probably believe the official account that it was a way to make the police look bad. And, And obviously, there's always the issue of like police corruption. They may just not have wanted to investigate it either. There could have been someone doing stuff and they were just told to knock it off. That's something else too, but but there's probably still people in town who believes it was some sadist who took at least 30 young lives over the course of 11 years and was never caught. Interesting to look at a urban legend that has so much backing to it. So many of these urban legends are based on a spooky location or some weird event from a long time ago. This one, the event was going on and the urban legend was being crafted murder by murder. The world can be a terrifying place. It can feel savage and cold sometimes. Where young people can be murdered and justice is never found for them. But I want to end this episode on a brighter note because originally I was going to I was going to do a scary ending. But let's end it on a brighter note. Yes, the world can be savage and dark from time to time. But you got to remember the Harveys out there. You got to remember the Harveys out there that are willing to risk their lives to save yours. And just even the act of telling the story of Harvey leaves a smile on your face. So sure, there may be a serial killer out there who got away with all of these crimes. They would most likely still be alive, honestly. Now we're getting dark again. But even though there is that darkness out there, we got to remember the Harveys. we got to be the Harveys. we got to be the Harveys. we got to be the shield against evils. Not just unnatural evils like serial killers or drug dealers and things like that. But natural evils like accidents and earthquakes, volcanoes. I don't know why. Know where I'm going with this. I don't know where I'm going with this. I want to just, we got to remember the positive too. It's horrible. I wish whoever did this, I'm still, I, it's the story is so fascinating to me because it might, I'm honestly, the police story makes sense to me. 
So maybe there wasn't a serial killer, and maybe the children... This is so dark, anyways, because it starts with dead, and it ends with dead children, but... Harvey... Let's go back to the Harvey thing. Let's all be Harvey. Let's try to be Harvey as much as we can. Like, obviously, you know, I talk about it on the podcast, I've done some rough and tumble things in my past, and... There's probably a lot of people who who are like, "Nah, you're not Harvey," and that's fine. That's fair because I'm I, not. You can't be Harvey all the time. Sometimes you just. Sometimes I don't know where I'm going with this. I don't know where I'm going with this. I'm not the good guy all the time. But that's the point, I guess. We don't have to be Harvey all. You're checking your watch. You're like, just wrap it up, Jason. You don't have to be Harvey every day. It's impossible to be Harvey every day. No one can always be the best example of humanity. But even if you're only Harvey one time in your life, that's enough. And if you're Harvey twice in your life, that's even better. Dead Rabbit Radio, which I'm so hot. I'm so hot. I've recorded three episodes today. Dead Rabbit Radio, gmail.com is going to be your email address. You can also hit us up at facebook.com slash Dead Rabbit Radio. What was that? All that Harvey stuff. Twitter is... <laughs> I liked it. I liked it, but... I can't see. It's so much sweat in my eyes. Twitter is at Dead Rabbit Radio. Dead Rabbit Radio is the daily paranormal conspiracy and true crime podcast. Don't have to listen to it every day. I'm glad you listened to it today. Have a great one. Good boy. Perf, perf. <laughs>